Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Dramatised for radio by Jonathan Holloway. Are you finished in the bathroom, Fanny? Yes, it's all yours. Oh, you look terrific. Of course. <laughs> hmm, I think I'm getting hairier. Well, use my removal cream. We are in a small flat occupied by two young women, student workers, who at the end of a normal day are getting themselves spruced up for the evening ahead. Listen to their happy voices. You would never guess what they do for a living, how they earn their bread, or how they expect to spend their leisure. Tonight would have been my 30th new man. In how long? Mm, there's six months since January. Mm, very good. Erica Height did a whole escalator squash team in public last weekend. Oh, gosh, she's such a show-off. What do you mean, would have been? I may just stay in. I'm not feeling too good. Well, what's the matter? Well, Dr. Wells says I should have a three-month pregnancy substitute. You're only 19. Let me introduce myself. My name is Helmholtz Watson. I've decided to write an account of what I now see as an irretrievably corrupted humanity. There might be a very slim chance people will return to a healthier way, and maybe that's why it's worth recording this. That's what I tell myself. I don't hold out much hope, but it is a way of perhaps preserving my own sanity just a little longer. Writing gives a reason not just to curl up with an overdose of the current neurotoxin of choice, Soma. Well, Dr. Wells says that women like me with wide pelvises ought to have their first simulated pregnancy when they're 17. Mm, I don't usually like wide pelvises, mm. but somehow you carry it off. <laughs> so anyway, I, I'm really two years late, not two years early. Are you taking your ovarian? Of course. And your placentin? Of course, Lenina. I'm not a dimwit epsilon. <laughs> It'll be a pain all weekend if you don't go out and have sex with someone. If I do have a simulated pregnancy, I shan't be able to have sex for a whole three months. Oh, not nice. It doesn't bear thinking about. <laughs> all the signs were there, but people didn't want to acknowledge them. Greed bent the post-enlightenment West out of shape. A very few people owned the wealth and they declared war on the intelligence of the populations of the developed world. America elected an amoral, aggressive gangster to the most powerful job anywhere. He let loose the dogs who turned civilization into a global cult of numbskull consumerism which would believe any rubbish as long as it justified breakneck consumption of sugar, drugs and no-strings sex. I assume you're going out. Yes. Who with? Henry Foster. Why are you still going out with him? It's only been four months. Four months is a lifetime. Surely you're bored at sex with one man. Well, no, actually. I'm not bored. I find it comfortable. Comforting. The director would be very upset. He and I did it last week. Oh, yes, how was it? Very dignified. Vigorous, mind you. Oh, good. But dignified, that's the best word. Although it's an everyday thing for us... I imagine you'll be confused. You see, for us now, promiscuity is the rule, not the exception. And there has been a deliberate process of blurring the line which used to separate childhood and sex. Sex is a proven commercial proposition. Childhood doesn't come anywhere near it in terms of profit. To be honest, I haven't been feeling very promiscuous lately. Mm. Well, there are times when I'd just rather not be doing it. But you've got to make the effort. Even if you don't want to. After all, everyone belongs wants. to everyone else. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, I have thought about it. And although I do find Henry a bit tedious, mm. just having any old sex with any old man seems a bit pointless. Better the lover you know, sort of thing. Careful who you say that to. You won't exactly make yourself popular. Of course, you started all this. Relationships require effort. And that kind of stamina got lost in your quick-fix world, where electronic devices enabled everyone to scan their immediate surroundings for the opportunity of a spot of spontaneous, blameless carnality. Do you know Bernard Marx? You're not serious. Why not? He's an alpha plus. Ooh. He's asked me if I want to go on holiday with him to New Mexico. <laughs> I've always wanted to see the reservations. I could go on about how your time got scared of global warming and disguised a land grab as a war between freedom and theocracy, and how you pasted over the cracks with aggressive sentimentality. But I won't. His face doesn't really fit. It'd be 
people say Bernard actually chooses to spend time on his own. I'm fond of Bernard. He's bright and sees through the gruesome gaiety of this world. He's the closest thing to a friend that I have. But sadly, I don't think he's got much strength of character. Well, I think he's clever and perceptive. <laughs> There's nothing attractive about Bernard Marx. He's too small. He's not at all handsome. He looks like he didn't get enough oxygen when he was in the flask. He's got funny little feet, and like a girl, and, and you know perfectly well what small feet mean. Oh, don't go on. He's got frizzy hair. Why would you want to be seen with someone like that? I think he's interesting. Bernard Marx has a thoughtful nature. And what's that got to do with anything? People will just think you're a bit stupid. You know what, Fanny? You've helped me make up my mind. <laughs> well, I'm stumped, but I suppose it's better than sticking with Henry. That really could get you into trouble. I was an unthinking, career oriented fellow once. An escalator squash champion who'd had 640 girls in four years. Then the veil fell from my eyes. The niggling sense of wrongness took over. And now I'm a secret dissident who wishes he wasn't but can't help it. There's no mystery left in our brave new world. No chase, no alluring electrical charges skittering over the surface of tremulous, fractured conversations, human to human. No, it's perfunctory and desperately, depressingly, aggressively dull. Have you got some soma you can lend me? I don't use it much these days. It takes the edge off. Really? I can't imagine having sex without it. I can't imagine anything without it. You will by now have realised... I'm talking to you from the future. One hundred years into the future, as a matter of fact. Yes. And thank you for laying the foundations of the reality I have to live with every day. Yes. Thanks a bunch. Enjoy these face-to-face -face sessions with the student body, but as the director of the London Hatcheries, I can't hide myself away with you all afternoon. <laughs> Sir, someone said you'd be teaching the electroaversive therapy module yourself. I used to, but not this year. Oh, I am an academic, too, but in the College of Emotional Engineering. I do a lot with media and conditioning, and mostly that involves making up stories, or, more accurately fictions that convince our people they're happy. I know how it all works from the rancid core outwards. Please stay with me as I reveal my world piece by rotten piece. Here is an eminent man giving his students a little tour. Please gather around. I don't like shouting. <clears throat> we give some embryos less oxygen. That retards their development. The lower the grade, the less the oxygen. The first organ affected is the brain, after that the skeleton. At 70% of normal oxygen, you get dwarfs. At less than 70, eyeless abominations. Such a smooth voice. It makes the extremity of what he does somehow acceptable. It's the same voice which only has to ask politely, and any of the young women he's training will gladly hop into bed with him. <laughs> Eugenics was, in your time, a dirty word something the Nazis did. Now, it's a respectable trade. You may ask, what does the hatchery hatch? The answer is human beings. We predestine and condition. We decant our babies as socialized human beings, as alphas or epsilons, as future sewage workers or future directors of hatcheries. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on up to the next floor. How many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is. A brave new world that has such people in it. Lowering the temperature in the incubators and bombarding them with X-rays leaves the grown human being with a horror of cold. These drones are predestined to emigrate to the tropics. The miners, acetate silk spinners and steel work. And why would that be appropriate? They thrive on heat. And that, in a nutshell, is the secret of happiness. Liking what you've got to do. Training teachers like me is high risk. They have to be educated to do their job, 
but they mustn't be educated enough that they start to question how things are done. The tendency towards doubt must be neutralized. If not, the result is self-loathing, antisocial behavior, and ultimately, the penal system. I can see from the sign, this is where we condition the Alpha Plus intellectuals. We need them smart, but thinking along pretty narrow pathways. They must, above all else, be useful. So we show the Alpha toddlers paintings from the past, and the names of novelists in big letters and other artifacts from dead history. While they're taking all that in, we hit them with huge volumes of industrial sound and give them electric shocks through the carpet. They dance and cry like puppets. We do it repeatedly. For them, books and paintings and words become associated with pain. And so they grow up safe from unhelpful ideas and ambitions, hating those useless old things all their lives. Hating what the old order called inquiry. But it doesn't work in every case. There isn't even the old pretense of democracy anymore. If you resist, you risk either being exiled to Iceland or banished to live with feral savages on reserves in America's far-flung places, the real world cloaks itself in a global system of ruthless nannying. Happiness and contentment are enforced with the threat of physical violence. The state arranges us according to a biologically determined caste system. Sex is now a compulsory recreation, and the idea that children might be born to a human mother is just appallingly embarrassing. Everyone belongs to everyone else. I hate this world. But I'm impotent else. before its massive, pillow-like everyone minister. Everyone belongs to everyone else. Everyone belongs to everyone else. Everyone Apple, belongs J.P. Morgan, to Ford Motor Corporation, Walmart and Samsung. These great companies are now universally recognized as among the central figures in the creation of a stable social structure founded on commercial priorities of production and consumption. Directive. Uh, no Sorry. more questions, I'm afraid. We're on the clock now. 150 years after Ford's first Model T went on sale, the principle of sleep teaching was discovered. We play children's lessons quietly into their ears, night after night, from small communication devices. Elementary class consciousness and elementary sex form the bedrock of teaching the under eights. Elementary dislike of other castes and an elementary desire to have sex with as many partners as time and opportunity will allow. Sexualizing of the child while also making sure there's no impulse to reproduce. Those are the great victories of our time. The only relief from torment comes in the few seconds after I've woken up in the morning. That's the pause between the dull ache of knowing something is wrong and the full-blown realization of the truth. That the world is intellectually dead. We thought sleep teaching could be used to make intellectuals, but we found it more useful as a way to inculcate the absolutes that determine rather than caress the mind. Ford was right. History is bunk. Thebes and Babylon, Knossos and Mycenae, Odysseus, Job, Jupiter and Jesus, Athens, Rome and Jerusalem, the cathedrals, King Lear and the thoughts of Pascal, passion, requiem and symphony, all bunk and now all gone. We are free released, and that includes women's previous enslavement to pregnancy. Oh yes, women no longer have to suffer the horror of having a live baby crawling about in their insides, oh. and we've all been relieved of the horror of growing up in a home with a family. Oh. <laughs> I imagine it was terrifying. <laughs> the public mind is cauterized by reverse morality. Friendship, love, simplicity, they're all drowned by enforced promiscuity, sensual and intellectual, self-love, materialism, fear of ageing, fear of wisdom. Can you pass my towel, Henry? I've got soap in my eye. I like to give her a whack on the thigh when we're at it. See the ripple travel across and the livid pink from the smack. Towel, Henry. Oh, thanks. Could you please not talk as if she's just meat? What's it to you? I'm the one going out with her. I can say what I like. She's certainly worth you having a go on. Wonderfully pneumatic. Oh, there you go again. I've asked her to come to New Mexico with me. She said she'd think it over. That's fine. Is it? Look, Bernard, you don't have to ask my permission. Lenina and I enjoy each other. But it's time we took a break. 
So, you're not getting possessive? Don't be daft. <laughs> Lenina is convenient, that's all. I'm being lazy. I just needed a shove to get me moving to passes new. Just think what it must have been like when people owned each other. At least we don't have to meddle in the past. Unlike those poor archaeologists. What archaeologists? Well, didn't you see it? They're on the news feed. Some poor bugger dug up a crucifix the other day. Heaven and immortality and all that. Uh, quite attractive ideas, though. Well, not serious. They were saps. And we just make do with Soma. Are you being sarcastic again? We're lucky, Bernard. No old age. Hormones, blood transfusions. Yes, nothing wrong with that. We don't change or learn, and our personality remain in a steady state. Makes for a comfortable life. Until it's time for organ failure or dementia, and then we cart it off to a dying centre to be ogled at by school kids until we pop an artery. You mean you didn't enjoy those visits when you were a kid? People used to get cleverer as they got older, more mature, wiser. I just want to buy stuff and muck about for the rest of my days, thank you very much. <laughs> if you want to get on, you'll knuckle down and do the same. After all, what did the past give us? What did all that history add up to? The Nine Years' War... Massive damage right across the globe. Chemical and biological destruction. Yeah, and now collaborative government across the entire world means we can spend, spend, spend anywhere and feel utterly bored all the time. I enjoy being bored. I like it very much. Very much indeed. <laughs> Lenina, where did you pop out from? I thought you'd be home by now. Well, I have been home. I, I, I got dolled up and came out hunting for you. <laughs> well, guess what? What? I just saw Benito Hoover in the lift. I had to laugh. Why? Well, under those clothes, he's as hairy as a primate. Uh, why would I want to know that? Oh, sorry. I, sorry, have I said something wrong? It doesn't matter. <laughs> well, I understand, though. I, I do, Bernard. One says those things because they're supposed to be funny, and, I mean, most of the time they are. <laughs> but these days, I, I find that sexy talk. Oh, I don't know. A bit sad. What do you mean? Uh, do me a favour, Lenina. What? Let's try and keep off the subject of your former conquests. I've been in a funny mood lately. Have you? I thought you were seeing Henry tonight. And George Edsel was in the lift, too. Why does that matter? I couldn't fancy someone with such big ears. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. <laughs> uh, you. You mentioned you wanted me to come to New Mexico. Did you mean it? Yes, of course. Uh, but look, I wouldn't want to put Henry's nose out of joint. Oh, he's uh, not bothered. Yes, he said the same to me. You do want to have me, don't you? Oh, absolutely. You haven't changed your mind, then? Absolutely not. <laughs> Are we flying out on the Blue Bullet? Yes. Out on the Charing Tower or Hampstead? Uh, I'm not sure. It's a lovely evening. Well, let's do something together, then. No, I... No, I have to go. Uh, Henry gets cross if I keep him waiting. I thought he wasn't bothered. Well, he, he just doesn't like lateness, says it's rude. Uh, well, well, let me know about the dates and good time, won't you, Bernard? My era takes no account of the price the planet pays for consumption. A small helicopter carves the heart out of the Earth to make and run it. I don't own one. Many do. Titanium gouged from the Far Eastern landscape, aviation fuel sucked from seabeds laid waste. Atmospheric warming raising sea levels so whole island communities just vanish. Four minutes late, Nadine. I'm sorry, Henry. I got held up chatting to your little friend Bernard Marx. He's not really my friend. I mean, he's all right and so on, but don't run away with the impression we're close. OK. But where are we going? Hold on. There's a red bullet coming in from New York. It's late, too. Those Atlantic services are always late. Uh, I thought we'd do a different route this time. Out over Notting Hill, Wilston, Ealing, the Hounslow Feely Studios. Then follow the Great West Road to Brentford, on to Stoke Poges for a round of obstacle golf. I don't like obstacle golf. All those electronic things that jump out and spin. I don't see why we can't just hit the ball towards a hole. You're sounding like a veggie. And I bet you've never met one. Anyway, what's being a vegetarian got to do with it? Oh, history, art, ecology, veggie, it's all the same. Being awkward for the sake of it. Oh, keep your hair on. I only said I wasn't keen on obstacle golf. Don't tell me to keep my hair on. We have a social responsibility to play things like obstacle golf. Otherwise, the inventors and the manufacturers will be out of business. 
Anyway, what kind of idiots would be entertained by simply hitting a ball and wandering after it? I asked my copter to be out of the hangar and ready by seven o'clock. What's going on? Sorry, Mr Marks, it's these Bokanovskis. Much worse than Epsilon's, I have to take what's quoted. Seven identicals, small, black and hideous, as thick as two short planks. You tell them something and they forget before the words are out of your mouth. In your time, you very nearly achieved a situation where skin colour didn't matter. But the wars and the migrations came, enemies were dehumanised through racial stereotypes, and the hatcheries shrunk brains accordingly. Ah, of course, sir. I don't mean you're like that. You're an alpha, after all. Just, uh A short one. Are you, uh Are you, uh going anywhere nice? Nice? Are you saying you have to file a flight plan, which I don't believe you do? Well, actually, I do, Mr Marks. Then write down I'm going to Propaganda House on Fleet Street. Ah. Whom shall you be seeing there? <sighs> My friend Helmholtz Watson. He's an Alpha Plus and he lectures in the Department of Writing at the College of Emotional Engineering. Helmholtz? It used to be only Americans who suffered from the poor spelling of semi-literate officials, meeting them at Ellis Island and scrawling approximations of their names. Now the whole world has to put up with the gaffes of petty, low-caste officialdom. You look a bit flummoxed. Unusual name. I haven't come across it before. Do you want me to write it down for you? Would you? That would be very helpful. Come holes, my dear hmm? fellow. How have you been? Bernard. Oh, kept myself this side of suicidal. <laughs> yeah, just when you think you're getting immune to stupid people, one of them does something really awful. <laughs> Last week, they were changing the office furniture around and someone found an actual book tucked behind some shelves. Erewhon, it was called. As you know, I love books. We were allowed restricted access to them when I was training. That's when I started keeping a diary. Shellholes. What about the microphone? No, it's after hours. The acoustic people go home on the dot of five. It's one of the many ineptitudes of totalitarianism. Anyway, instead of treating the book as a curio, they phoned the police, who came and put it in a sealed container ready to be incinerated. Is that someone's name? Erewhon? <sighs> Bernard. Think about it. What do you mean? Well, it's nowhere spelled backwards, isn't it? <sighs> the writer's name was Samuel Butler. Well, what was the subject of the book? Who knows? I caught a glance at the back cover. Dystopian, it said. Whatever that means. Right, I'm done. Let's get out of here. The press club? Ah, oh, why not? Let's see if anyone interesting is in tonight. You know, Helnots, you really do need to be a bit more careful. You're too damn clever. It makes people suspicious of you. I get some of the same, not because I'm clever, but because I'm too damn short. And I'm just built too damn big. You'd think in a seat of learning, we'd be beyond this claptrap. Toe the line, keep your head down. The academia is now a byword for brown nosing and knitting your brow at people like me. To be honest, I've no idea why they still trust me with students. Mm. Words are dangerous. And wordsmiths are simply not to be trusted. We like to think of ourselves as rebels, don't we, you and I? But actually, we're just tame monkeys. They keep us as pets so they can show off how enlightened they are. It's a measure of how limp we are that we're still employed. As soon as we became a real threat, we'd be out on our ears, or much worse. I got a dressing down from the director of the hatchery yesterday. Well, that's what he thought he was doing. I walked into his office to ask for a permit to fly to New Mexico to have a peep at the ferals. I want to take a girl with me. Has she got a brain? Yes, actually. I'm quite optimistic about her. The New Mexico reservation, I see. Hmm. I went there once. Must have been your age. So, 25 years ago, then. Don't look so worried. And for a while he went rambling on, got lost in his own memories of trekking in the reservations. I had the same idea. Got a permit for New Mexico, took a girl to look at the savages. She was a beta minus. Yellow hair, particularly pneumatic. We peered at the feral savages and rode about on horses. And then she got lost up some revolting mountain. What did he mean, lost? He certainly let something slip there. Something he didn't intend to. I went to sleep, and she must have gone for a walk. When I woke up, she wasn't there. And there was a huge thunderstorm. I searched, and I shouted. She must have fallen into a gully or 
been eaten by a mountain lion. I dream about it sometimes. Hmm. Fancy that. And then he seemed to come to. Woke up, sort of thing. Realised what it said. Don't get the wrong idea. There was nothing wrong about our relationship. Nothing emotional or drawn out. And that's when he made a pathetic attempt to turn the tables by telling me off. <laughs> I think I ought to take this opportunity, Mr Marks, to say I am not at all pleased with what I hear of your behaviour away from work. I have the good name of the Hatchery Centre to think of. High caste staff must be above suspicion. So, he lost his marbles. Mm. Your director has an emotional side, then. If I hear any more about you behaving strangely, undermining the codes that forbid monogamy and free thinking, I will transfer you to the Hatchery Sub-Centre in Iceland. Oh, yes. He thought he'd given me a dressing down. But I banged the door behind me as I went. Oh, and I imagine you swaggered a bit and whistled as you walked away down the corridor. I did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Damn it! You were warning me just now, but if you're not careful, that bastard's going to start a witch hunt. I'm not afraid. Well, you should be. You're fond of boasting and showing off your disdain to people who are too stupid to put up with it. Ah, at last, the lift's here. Surprise. Oh, yes. Dolores, isn't it? That's right. Dolores Genectidy. I'm in your second semester class on image manipulation. And who are you? Oh, you don't know me. What a coincidence, bumping into you, Professor. <laughs> She's not telling the truth. <laughs> We've been riding this lift for the last 20 minutes, hoping to catch you. <laughs> Why would you do that? We thought you might come and have a picnic supper with us on Dartmoor. No. I don't think so. I'm with my friend here. Oh, I'm afraid we weren't planning to share you with anyone else. <laughs> we want to eat and drink and make love on a mountain. Both of us and just you. You're such a big chap. <laughs> we want to try you out. Find out if everything is in proportion. And also, you're a bit thrilling, aren't you? Am I? A dark horse. Mysterious. An enigma. I'd like to be able to say you've had me. Me too. Here we are. Ground floor. Oh, dear. Already? Afraid so. Now then, I've been looking forward to seeing my friend here. Well, the whole point was two on one. I wasn't suggesting a double date. Well, we were two of us, one of you. But if you'd rather go out with your friend, well, it's disappointing, but it's your lookout, I'm afraid. I'll see you around. <laughs> Thank you. I suppose... Goodbye, then. Oh, these young women. They're too awful for words. It's Lenina Crown. What? The girl I'm taking to New Mexico. Her name is Lenina Crown. Do I know her? She's training at the Central London Hatchery. We're on different floors. You know, I... I really can't stand all this anymore. I've cut out all my regular girls. Of course, the dean has made a fuss about it. You'll lose your post if you're not careful. But haven't you ever felt... Uncomfortable living like this. All the time. But to be honest, I don't know why. I've been working on some ideas. Hmm. I think we weren't made for all this promiscuity. We're not instinctual creatures anymore. We're cultural creatures. We weren't made for some great natural world competition to spill our genes into every passing female. We've lost the sense of connection between sex and love and, hmm. and the great story of life. Our lives are like a series of bus stops. We get off at one for a while. But then get back on the bus and then, and then get off at the next stop and the next and the next. There's no epic sweep to it. That's brilliant. Ah, oh, great phrase. I want to write about it, but I don't have the tough words I need. Our language feels mimsy-pimsy in comparison to the way I believe people used to speak. Every now and again, you hear an unfamiliar word with thick coarse contours, and it hints at a past when people could talk tough and think tough as a result. You look like you're in pain, Helmut. I need better words. More violent words. One thing I know for sure. I can't go on writing about nothing that matters. Uh, while I'm away... Away? Where? In New Mexico with this girl. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, yes. While I'm away... Will you keep a lookout for me? What do you mean? 
I'm convinced the DLH said more to me about New Mexico than he intended. I don't want to get stabbed in the back in my absence just to let him off the hook. I'll keep my ears open. Mm. Call me any time, day or night, if you hear Iceland and my name in the same sentence. Mm? Come on. Mm. <clears throat> So this really is a date, Bernard? Yes. Well, yes. But a kind of a preliminary date. A, a sort of mutual test drive before we go all the way to America together. Uh, where shall we fly off to this afternoon? Well, I was thinking about swimming at Talkie Country Club. Uh, and then maybe we could have dinner at the Oxford Union. Well, both of those are going to be very crowded. Oh, I suppose you want to play obstacle golf then. I'm afraid I find that a waste of time. Oh, good. I'm glad. Why? Because I don't see the point of it either. Say that again. Pardon? Why don't you like obstacle golf? All the electronic gizmos that make it so difficult are just silly. I'd rather be in bed having sex or dancing or eating a nice meal. Lenina, I've been searching for someone like you. What am I like, then? And if you say interesting, I'm going to ask to go straight home. What's wrong with being interesting? Well, that's what people say about ugly women. Oh, that Jackie so-and-so, she's really interesting. I'm not a brave man. But I think I know what matters. And I hope one day to find someone with whom I can share... Oh, I don't know. Share an affinity with whom I can be spontaneous. Spontaneous? It's a bit of a naughty word. A bit sort of tingly. <laughs> I like you using racy words like that. I know. Why don't we stop talking and leave London without planning anything? I'm supposed to punch in a flight plan. I have been up in helicopters lots of times with men who have forgotten to send a flight plan. Nobody cares about them, really. It's just a silly rule. Uh, I wouldn't want to draw too much attention. So you don't want to be spontaneous? All right. I'm going to take you somewhere that's completely isolated. But Bernard, there's no need. We'll be together by ourselves all night. I mean somewhere majestic. <laughs> you really are completely off the scale, Bernard. Bonkers. <laughs> but I like it. Uh, do you want some soma? Absolutely not. I want to be wide awake with you, Lenina, drinking in the sight and sound and smell of you. I should run a mile. There's something about you, Mr. Marks. Hold on. All that water, where are we? Heading out over the Thames estuary. You mean we're over the sea? Well, where are we going? The North Sea. Look. No, oh, but it's horrible. It, it, it's cloudy and the surface is... Very lumpy. Turn the radio on, please, quickly. No. What? I don't want that incessant, Mark. I, I want to look out at the sea and feel lost. We're not lost, though. But that's how I want to feel. But music takes your mind off things. And to tell you the truth, I'm getting a bit scared. Oh, why on earth be scared? The land is disappearing. There's nothing but greeny grayness. It makes me feel as though... As though I'm more me, not so completely part of someone else's plan. Where do you get these unsettling ideas? From my friend, Helmut. He's got a brain the size of a planet and he's brilliant. And he's unhappy and hates everything all the time. Oh, don't you think we should turn around? Don't you want to be free, though, Lenina? Not if this is what you mean. Besides, I am happy. Sort of. And I think I feel as free as I want to be. <laughs> oh, yes. Everyone's happy nowadays. Wouldn't you like to be free in your own way? I think you'd better take me back to London. But we're more intimate here. More, more together, aren't we? With nothing but the sea and the moon. No one can hear us or see us. Please, don't be angry. But I'm not really coping. Can we go home now? All right, then. We'll go back. I've always had a bad feeling about Bernard. He's quite frail. Tends to jump at things without considering the consequences. I worry that he misreads me. I've got used to keeping a part of me sacred. The part that knows this world is a pale shadow of what it should be and that they did things better in the past. I've learned not to take hold of the rope with which I might be permitted to hang myself. Bernard is an idealist, and an idealist is just one notch away from a martyr. Anyway, Bernard returned to London and took Lenina to his apartment. He was in a strange mood, hysterical, chugging down Soma like it was Sweeties. I know what's supposed to happen now. I'll put some music on, something smooth and romantic, and then you'll take hold of that diagonal zipper and slowly draw it down across your body. 
Then step out of your jumpsuit and walk to the bathroom, passing close enough that I can smell your scent. Certainly. I am trying to behave as one ought to. Pardon? You look... lovely. Mm. Pneumatic. Uh, not too skinny, though. Perfect. Perfect muscular elongated haunches. Perfect cuts of meat. What? It's something my friend Helmholt said, the way people talk about women. You know, I didn't want today to end in us just going to bed... Then what did you want? I wanted, just for once, to try for a real connection. For sex to come with a garnish, I wanted to be made to wait. Tantalised. I didn't want just to be given it on a plate, accompanied by a limp smile. I don't think my smile is limp. Uh, that's not what I meant. I'm getting mixed up. Mm. I want to build to a climax. I want to start from nowhere and get worked up. I, I want us to do it in a frenzy, pulling and pushing at each other like savages. <laughs> oh, you poor thing. You're very romantic, aren't you? I, I don't believe that's an affliction. We're taught romance is degenerate. Hmm. All the same, Bernard. I do like you. You have nice hands. I just wish you weren't so odd. Now, come on. I'll take the lead, if you like. Uh, I'm in your hands. Bernard kept his word. A week later, he and Lenina rocketed across the Atlantic Ocean and were soon exploring a huge, utterly tasteless room in a New Mexico mid-range casino hotel, all mustard-coloured plastic and brown hessian walls. Ah, you're here. Oh. I was waiting <clears throat> by the reception desk, uh, but that's fine. And what do you need to talk to us about? You can't rush this sort of thing. Better safe than sorry when it comes to going out to the reservations. There's no actual danger, though? Not these days, no. The ferals, or savages, as you Brits call them, have experienced reprisals when they've gotten out of order. They're pretty amiable now. Mind you, you're in for a shock. There's no television where you're going. No hot water, even. Did you hear that, Lenina? I think I can manage. You mustn't come to the reservation unless you really want to. I've made up my mind, I think. Very well, then. All righty. So, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Lady and gentleman. Uh. Hmm. The Malpais Reservation covers 560,000 square kilometres and is divided into four distinct sub-reservations. Each is surrounded by a high-tension wire fence. Dad. What's the matter? I promised to telephone Helmholtz Watson. I, I just remembered. The reservation is supplied with current by the Grand Canyon Hydroelectric Station. Could we hurry up? I need to make a call. <clears throat> Upwards of 5,000 kilometres of fencing run around each sub-reservation, carrying a current of 60,000 volts. Really? How fascinating. Yes, um... Touching the fence will result in instantaneous death. <sighs> There is, as you will have gathered, no escape from a savage reservation. I ought to make that call. Perhaps I should say there is no escape for those born on the reservation. And remember, my dear young lady, in the reservation, children are born. Oh, whoops. Do you really have to use that word? We're in a wild place, miss. Yes, they are actually born. Oh. Revolting as it may seem, those born on the reservation are destined to die there. Destined to die. That's fine. Let's, let's stop there. I have to carry on, I'm afraid. <clears throat> If you ask me how many people live on the reservation, I have to say we do not know. We can only guess. About 60,000 Indians and half-breeds. Absolute savages. Our inspectors occasionally visit them, but otherwise they have no communication with the outside world. They still preserve such repulsive customs as marriage, if you know what that is. Families. No conditioning of the children of any serious kind. Monstrous superstitions, Christianity, ancestor worship, that sort of thing. The use of extinct languages, Sunni, Spanish, Athapascan. There are ferocious animals such as pumas and porcupines. There are infectious diseases, priests and venomous lizards. How fascinating. My phone is ringing. I can't hear it. It's on vibrate. I'm just going to nip at you to carry on. <laughs> uh-huh. So... Hello, Bernard. I thought you uh, 
problem in America. I am, but I needed to call you. You said the other day you were going to dig around to find out where I really stand with the director of the London Hatchers. And I did. I was going to leave it until you got back. But I didn't want to spoil your holiday. Uh, go on, then. The director of the London Hatcheries said something indirectly in public yesterday about you. What was it? That he's looking for someone to take your place. Did he mention anything about Iceland? Yes, I'm afraid he did. He mentioned how much they needed quality staff like you out there. Oh, no. What's the matter, Bernard? I'm going to be sent to Iceland. Uh, excuse me, I have to finish the briefing. Uh, carry on, then. Don't be alarmed, but it's best you're prepared. What for? When we fly in over the electric fence, you'll see a lot of carcasses inside the wire. The animals never learn what the fence really is and what it will do to them. You will be staying at the Malpais Rest House. There will be a dance there this evening. Hmm. I will take you there accompanied by my own sullen young savage. He'll keep you amused. He's funny, <laughs> the way he pulls faces and jumps about. But don't worry, we'll be back here tomorrow. Just remember, they are perfectly tame. Savages won't do you any harm. They've had plenty of torture and starvation when they act up. He absolutely stinks. He actually makes people sick. Who does? Our guide. What? I don't like his face. It's peculiar. Halfway between a Chinaman and an Asian, I don't like looking at it. And anyway, when he's going ahead, his back shows he hates us. Back? What can't you see? His back is making no secret of it. So what? We need him to get us to the village. Oh, Ford. Oh, oh, he's got another whiff. And why did the helicopter have to leave us at the rest house? Why couldn't they fly us up here? I hate walking. But you feel so small when you're on the ground at the bottom of a hill. Who are all these people? They're the villagers. Why are they dressed like that? They're practically naked. Horrible guide gone. The Nina. The true spirit of adventure requires we observe, study, try to understand. We don't need to be spoon fed a running commentary. Besides, they don't speak English. They're like children. They've woven furry stuff into their hair. Those feather cloaks are fantastic. Imagine the work. What are these two doing? What do they think they're carrying? Snakes, I believe. Oh, keep them away. Keep them away uh, from me. There they go. Sneaky, horrible guy, Jack gone. He's done this deliberately. He knows we weren't supposed to be left on our own. He went into that cave thing. Oh, how could they be able to live like this? This is a prison, Lenina. They can't just leave. They've lived like this for centuries. I, I suppose they must have been used to it. No one has invited them into the civilized world. Oh, look at that man on the ladder. Oh, he's so skinny and slow. With a terrible body like that, he should have the decency to cover up. What's wrong with him? Give me some soma. Uh, I don't have any. Well, you didn't bring any with you? No. Oh, great. And now what's happening? What are those women doing? They're feeding their babies from their breasts. It looks like a wonderfully intimate relationship, doesn't it? I think we miss out on not having mothers. And perhaps you'll miss out as well by not being a mother, Lenina. Oh, yuck. Please, Bernard. I'd rather you didn't swear like that. You know, the M word. I confess I was jealous when I heard the details of their trip. I've not been to the reservations. I've not seen the savages firsthand. It's a regret. I would love to have been exposed to that decrepitude, the smells, the way other lives can be led. Bernard has his fascination with science, but I would really have liked to have watched Lenina's face, watch those layers of crudeness being peeled back. What's the matter with that? Is it a woman? She's got a huge thing around her neck. That's called a goiter. Oh, yuck. We, we did experiments on that condition. It's fascinating, actually. A goiter is a swelling of the neck associated with a thyroid gland that's not functioning properly. 90% of cases are caused by preventable iodine deficiency, which is a significant cause of intellectual disability. 
typically occurs on remote inland areas where no marine foods are eaten. It's also common in mountainous regions of the world where food is grown in iodine poor soil. They should eat fish. The ocean is only an hour away by helicopter. <laughs> I don't have helicopters. Well, someone should do something. Ferals don't matter. No one thinks their suffering is a problem. Well, it looks like a pretty big problem for her, and it's a problem for me having to look at it. He wants to take us inside to look at a dwelling. Oh, you must be kidding. Smoke, bird fat, sweat, and a bucket of poo. Well, you really know how to give a girl a good time. You should broadcast on the Holiday Channel. I think this cave passes through the rock, and there, out there, there's another terrace. Can you see? Mm. That's where the drums have been taken. Can you feel the mood, the excitement? Oh, there's, there's something nasty going on. Why am I not surprised? There's blood. They're scourging you. What? I brought you here because I genuinely thought you'd be interested. Why don't you give your brain a chance? Just look at what's going on. They're whacking and scratching him in time with the drums. He's a sacrifice. It's a bloodletting. I am not going out there. It's a classic scapegoat situation. One person is symbolically sacrificed to wipe away the sins of the community. It's the, you know, the Jesus thing. Why are you talking like that? It's disgusting. Look at the way the boy's welcoming it. Look at him smiling so proudly. He clearly doesn't want to run away. It's an honour to, to perhaps make the crops grow, to perhaps show them he's a man. Oh, it's fascinating. My son would have been a much better choice. The multitudinous seas incarnadine. Uh, what? It's not fair. They won't let me be the sacrifice. I could have bled twice as much and not felt it. You're civilized, aren't you? You come from the other place. Well, you look like us, not them. And the Indians hate me because I'm fair. Linda is my mother. Hey, don't look at her like that, Cerdos. <coughs> How did you get here? Um... I, I came from London a long time ago. <coughs> Before he was born with the bastardo who was his father. <coughs> she doesn't like talking about it. My mother... Well, do you have to use that word? But that's what she is, perro orgulloso. Oh, uh, please, don't take offence. Please, please, carry on. She went walking alone in the mountains to the north. She fell into a ravine and hurt her head. Go on, please. Hunters from Malpais found her and brought her to the Pueblo. Linda never saw my cobarde father again. <laughs> Linda, what was his name? <laughs> I'd rather not Su talk nombre about... es Thomas. <laughs> That's the first name of the director of the London Hatchery. <laughs> I don't think you should jump to any conclusions. Something <laughs> similar happened when he came to New Mexico. Well, how do you know? He told me himself. Well, he wouldn't have told you if you thought there was a chance you'd run into her. Unless he was convinced she's dead. Maybe he tried to kill her. Maybe he thought it succeeded. He thought we died. Both of us. Him inside me. <laughs> See? Muerto. <laughs> Otherwise, he would not have had the courage to leave. My mother doesn't talk about it because, um, el, le duele el corazón. It hurts her heart. She tries not to care about what Thomas did to her, but I see the sorrow in her face every day when the mezcal wears off. He must have been a bad man, un hombre no natural, to run away and leave her alone, to fly away and leave me as well. There will be a judgment on him one day. <laughs> Come on, Bernard. The director of hatcheries wouldn't have partnered. Uh, slept with. Covered. Someone like that. You mean someone immensely fat, with a lined face, sagging cheeks, <coughs> two teeth missing at the last count, stinking of drink, and unwashed. Oh, my dear. Mi querida. <coughs> <coughs> I didn't always look like this. You see, here, we actually do get old. I've still got the clothes I came in, put away in a box, but they don't fit. Haven't for a long time. <laughs> There's no Soma here. I only have mezcal when the man Papi brings it. Estaba tan avergonzada. So ashamed. Me. 
Abita having a baby. I, I still don't know how it happened. I don't know what to say. Um, th th there are no handkerchiefs here either. There's just filth. Filth. How did you meet Thomas? I worked in the fertilising room at the central London hatchery. Oh, that's where I work. The way they make babies here and relationships. No doubt you all think it's disgusting. Well, tell us. In your world, everybody belongs to everybody else. But here, nobody is supposed to belong to more than one person. And if you have people in the civilised way, lots of them... These people think you're wicked and antisocial, and they don't know anything about controlling their fertility. Las mujeres, the, the women here, have children over and over again. Like dogs. <laughs> but how did you manage to get pregnant before you came here? I said I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, John has been a great comfort to me. Te amo, madre. He has tried to kill some of the men when they come near me. Men like Papi with his mezcal. John gets his ideas from the Indians. He has always spent time with them, despite the fact they don't like him. I, I couldn't condition him. I don't know how to. Don't you dare look down on us. Pardon? I've been watching the girl's face. You mean me? How do your women avoid getting pregnant? Chemicals. Productos químicos. And where do you get them from? Out of bottles. No, I mean, how are they made? In factories. That's right. But how? I don't know. Do you know, Bernard? No, not really. <coughs> the Indians know more than you. The great god, Awona Wilona, made all things out of the fog of increase. His seed was laid in four wombs to make all that we find on Earth. You used some words just now when we met you. Strange words that I seem to have heard before. The, the multitude in a seas in Carnadine. Where did you get that? William Shakespeare. Ugh, we managed to get rid of him. But to live in the rank sweat of unseemed bed, stewed in corruption, hunting and making love over the nasty star. The dealer, Papi, who came and used my mother under the sable wings of night. He brought me a book. The complete works of William Shakespeare. His words take something ugly and makes it again in the year. So it has beauty, a pesar de si mismo. What's he talking about? Something we've lost, I fear. Papi. A man who could smile and smile and be a villain, eh? I tried to kill him when I was small. I didn't succeed. I would if I tried now. He bled. He stared into my eyes, bleeding, holding me down. Pero él no me mató. He just left, and we never saw him again. <coughs> are you... are you all right? Is she... Is she right? Oh, she's sick. <coughs> the mezcal has made her sick. You look disgusted. <laughs> and bored. You're alone, you see. Utterly alone. We only have each other. We speak English to each other. And you are the first we have spoken to for many years. It's very good of you to speak to me, uh, Master Vermont. You've told your story to three levels of administrators so far this morning and frightened the wits out of each in turn. Are you going to frighten the wits out of me? Uh, that isn't my intention. You uh, only get one crack at speaking to the controller in Whitehall. I hope you're going to impress me. I have discovered... An English woman and her son living in squalor among the Indians of the Malpais Reservation in New Mexico. This has been explained I, to me. I have listened to their story, and I believe the director of hatcheries deliberately disposed of this woman. Possibly attempted to kill her in order to avoid a scandal. I want the woman and the boy recovered to civilization. 
I shall, within the next 15 minutes, send the necessary orders to the warden of the reservation. I would like you to proceed to the warden's office. I expect you to accompany them back to London. Oh, and Mr. Marks. Uh, yes. I also expect absolute discretion in all matters pertaining to this affair. You will report directly to me and no one else. You will be given the number for my private line, and I expect to hear from you every day. Good morning. In Brave New World by Aldous Huxley, dramatised for radio by Jonathan Holloway, Bernard was played by Justin Salinger. Helmholtz by Jonathan Coy, Lenina by Pippa Bennett Warner, and John by Milton Lopez. The director of the London Hatcheries was played by Anton Lesser, Linda by Karina Fernandez, Fanny by Nicola Ferguson, and Henry by Sam Riggs. The warden was James Laley, and Mustafa Mond, Sean Baker. Other roles were played by Scarlett Brooks, Brian Prothero, and members of the cast. The producer was David Hunter.